Kina kato kato ko bin mo te mana ko te rakaia te awa ko Sean Henley toko ngā no taumutu aho ke niwa fakatu aho i mahi anana tēnā tato kato. To carry out this review, I did library searches, I also searched through historic newspapers using papers past, and also resorted to Google sometimes. And with the help of Steve Ervich, I've also been able to speak to some of the local long-term residents in Kamatua, and also some people that responded to the Tell Your Story page that was put up on the the uh, council website. And of a number of questions that were asked of me for the brief of this project, one of the main questions that was asked was, has there been a shifting baseline occurred over time? And by a shifting baseline, we mean, has human record and memories not kept pace with the actual changes that have occurred to the seabed habitats of Totoranui? And another key brief that I want to address today is what are the risks associated with a business as usual approach to management of Queen Charlotte Sound. So compared with other continents, New Zealand was colonised late in human history, but there was there's definitely evidence that Maori were were here way way before the Europeans, and in the the literatures. Some of the stories that came that I found, um, some that stuck out stuck out in my mind were some of the mysteries around the supposed pit, pit people, what they were called, or Nati Moi Moi. Some people referred to them as, which may be descendant of Waitaha, uh, which is also what I've been told by some people. But on, on the right hand side, the, this is a watercolour by Sir William Fox. <coughs> 1848 of Waitoi, which is now Picton Harbour. See here the little spit where the footbridge now lies. So this is where the marina is now, and Waikawa Marina would be up top right hand corner. And we can see from this image there, there's not a lot of trees left. And if, if that watercolour was true, then you know, a lot of the bush was, was gone at, at that time. A fire was an important tool for both Maori and early European colonisers. Uh, in the neighbouring Waimea Plains, M Maori modified over a thousand acres of soil for the addition of large quantities of charcoal and gravel, and that was used to improve the drainage and also heat retention in the soils for growing good kumara. And it was interesting, there's a report that actually compared the, the soil types in those Waimea soils to the, the US potato, uh, sweet potato manual back in the early 1900s and the soil types were pretty much similar. So, you know, the Maoris had worked out how to, how to grow a good sweet potato. And it's my hypothesis that the, the early Maori would have also probably carried out similar activities in, in Queen Charlotte Sound, so they, were, they would have had some uh, horticulture and modified some of the soils, and in doing so, some soil and also nutrients would have entered the sea. So they may have created a bit of productivity in the water at the time. But Europeans greatly accelerated the removal of the bush from the steep slopes of Queen Charlotte Sound by milling timber, especially up in the Grove Arm was an important place for timber production in the early days, and for developing land, the land for farming. And this is a couple of villages here Yuru Bay on the southern side of Arapawa Island uh, on Tui Channel. And uh, there's a lady who, who I work with. Uh, it was actually her grandfather's farm. 
Mitch Jackson, and you can see the, the sheep and the, and the yards right down on the beach, and all the wool bales lined up on the, on the wharf ready to be shipped off for sale. There was also a little bit of mining in the area. There was the Intimity Mine out in Resolution Bay. And you can see in this image there's a bit of forestry clearance associated with some of the habitation in that area during that time. And also, in maybe this is 1897 image from looking back from the snout towards Picton, and you can see a lot of deforestation on the hills there. Sort of supports the earlier image. Excuse, excuse me, Sean. Just, yes. just uh, that picture over there looks more like a dev, not, not Resolution Bay. The end of money mines on the top of uh, where you care to do. Ah, well, my mistake, sorry. Yeah. They were in end of money. And the removal of the protective bush and the use of fire led to erosion, releasing large quantities of sediment and nutrients into the sea. As much of the land in Queen Charlotte Sound is too steep to farm, uh, Pinus radiata forestry was developed in the 1960s and a lot of the other unproductive farmland has been left to regenerate. But unfortunately, as Steve Ehrlich has reported in his earlier reports, that on slopes exceeding 30 to 40 degrees, erosion frequently occurs, shedding large volumes of sediment into streams in which flow into the sea. And this is a slip that occurred up above Tory Channel. And these, the, the, there's a vulnerability window of the first five to eight years after replanting where the root zones of the trees haven't developed enough to hold the soils together. So you, you get a, a, that time period where erosion can occur. And yeah, these trees are quite, quite young here. Once in the sea, fine sediment is dispersed by waves and tidal currents. The image on the left is actually, I've put two images together. One is the, on the land showing where the forestry is in green. This is from Steve Ehrlich's report. And in the background is a report by Mark Hadfield from Niwa. And anything in blue is where sediment that's transported into the sea will settle out, so it won't be resuspended. So what we have here is that the bulk of the Queen Charlotte is actually acting as a sink for sediment, fine sediment, so most of that sediment will not get washed out again. But unfortunately, as Emma alluded to, fine sediments can act as a, a toxin in the marine environment, and as little as 26 milligrams of fine sediment mixed into a litre of water and, and fed to the likes of oysters, mussels and sponges can affect their health after a two week period as a report by Schwartz et al in 2016. And that 26 milligrams is actually, there's 260 milligrams of sediment in that teaspoon, which is a very small amount just the amount in that red ring. And, but the likes, the filter feeders like mussels are very effective at removing some of the sediment from the water column, but it, it has a cost to their health. I was also very fortunate to talk to a long-term resident of Cape Jackson, David Baker, who's a fisherman out there. And he's documented over time for a recent review and for the uh, Aotearoa Fisheries Limited that was instigated by them, looking, uh, looking at the loss of Macrocystis kelp in Queen Charlotte Sound. And he reported that in the inner Queen Charlotte there was 100% loss, and he estimates 90% loss in the yellow area here out in the outer Queen Charlotte, as compared with about 40% loss in Queen Charlotte Sound. So if we here where the sediment gets transported quickly through and out of Tory Channel, you can still get some macrocystis there surviving, but where it's accumulating, we're getting loss of kelp. 
And interestingly, David commented that he thought some of the sediment was coming from the North Island and large storm events that had occurred up there. And he reported that in the past, when he, when he first moved to the Outer Sounds, he thought it took you know, a couple of days after a big storm for the water to clear, but now he's saying it can take weeks. So he's noticed a change, a big change in the amount of sediment coming. Fish have been a very important component of human history of Queen Charlotte Sound, and fish are important to the seabed, as some of them actually live there, like flatfish, and others rely on it for shelter, and fish can fertilise the seabed, and they can also disturb it with their feeding. And from the first snapper, this is an image, a line drawing driven, drawn by James Cook's artist on board, Johan Forster, in 1774 on the return voyage of Cook to Queen Charlotte Sound. And it was given to me by a local, uh, Mr Rocco. And to the oysters that were harvested from Oyster Bay and Torrey Channel and shipped to the oyster saloons of Nelson, uh, Eric Jorgens in for this advertisement. <laughs> and there's also this report from a fisherman who recorded in 1906 catching more fish on a fishing trip in Queen Charlotte Sound than a similar trip he'd taken to Fj in Fjordland. And I don't think you would make that comparison today. A healthy pilchard fishery operated in the late 1800s and again in the 1940s. Uh, the pilchard were known as moi moi, herring or the Picton bloater. And the fishery exceeded 400 tons in 1942 with legendary catches regularly of two, two tons off the Picton wharf with one epic 10 ton haul recorded in a newspaper article. Uh, and that fishery ceased in 1950 with intermittent landings up until the 90s. Crayfish were also present in great numbers before widespread use of power boats and scuba gear in the 1960s. And these are some of the comments that I've had from the, the locals that I've talked to. And the, these crayfish is actually on one of the ferry terminal pilings when we first started doing port surveys here in, in, in Picton. Um, so there's a story for you to read about the fate of those uh, crayfish. In the, in the early days, they, they must have been very large. They were referred to as man-eaters. And also, uh, actually, the lady I went with, her grandfather took this photo of the Peak Brothers coming through Tory Channel from the outer sounds with the deck of the Ida is lined there with sacks of crayfish. So there, were, there used to be a great bounty. In 1908, Groper were reported as to be so abundant in the outer Queen Charlotte that they formed surface feeding shoals, and you couldn't row amongst them without striking the oars. The fish could be caught by harpoon, hook, or gaff. Today, you'd be lucky to catch a grouper in Queen Charlotte Sound, I think. Um, I've only ever seen two in diving depths in my days of diving. I've been very fortunate to get paid to go diving through it around the country. And I've only ever seen one in Fiordland and this guy here that was living on a reef in Spirits Bay in Northland. And that was at five metres of depth. And I've had it reported to me from a fisherman that I... I was on, on a boat with for a couple of weeks in Fiordland who fished out of Riverton. He was a blue cod fisherman and he has said that occasionally you still see surface feeding shoals in, in Fiordland. So this phenomenon apparently still occurs in remote areas. With the abundance of fish, fishing was encouraged by the government of the day the first steam trawler, the Waitara, here started fishing the outer sounds in 1908, whereas before that most fish were caught by handline or by set net. And Tom reported to me, Tom Norton is here today, recalls fishing with his father as a boy and catching 15 to 20 dozen large cod a day in Torrey Channel with a handline. And he said that they 
they fished for about three years using those methods. However, by 1925, inshore fishermen started to complain of reduced numbers of blue cod in Polaris and Queen Charlotte Sound. And interestingly, in a 1956 study found, found that pilchards and sprats were the dominant food found in the guts of blue cod in the Marlborough Sounds in those early days. So there was definitely a food chain link between the, the picked and bloater and the old cod populations. In 1939, there was a visit by Sir Harry Twyford, who was the former mayor of London, and I looked it up, he, he was the mayor of London in 1937, and it appears he had been to New Zealand 35 years previously, and he reported on his return trip a great deterioration of sea fishing at Cable Bay in Nelson and in Queen Charlotte Sound. He said, said he'd been told by fishermen that they blamed trawlers for destroying breeding grounds, and he thought the government would be wise if it made it illegal to fishing within a stated limit of the shore and that they should not be allowed at all in the sounds. He also regretted the loss of bush on the country and does not look good for grazing or anything else. And that was 1939. Trawling and dredging that disturbs the seabed can remove complex habitats. And metal dredges, trawl doors, ground ropes and the bobbins on the ropes can leave traces on soft sediment. And so this is a diagram of a typical trawl setup. You have the trawl doors at the front of the net keeping the net open, and you have the, the ground rope and orange there. And sometimes they have bobbins that scrape along the bottom to keep the ground line off the bottom. And this is a mark in the, the sediment that we videoed one day up in Tasman Bay, where quite often they use um, keep the nets on the bottom to catch flatfish. And this is a typical ring bed dredge showing the other guy at the front uh, that's used in um, at the top of the south here for scallop and <coughs> oyster dredging. The first thing to be affected by fishing gear that contacts the seabed are the organisms that are protruding above the sediment and forming complex structures. And I don't know if you recognise it, but it's, it's a horse mussel that's colonised by these are colonial ascidians. There's a solitary ascidian here. There's some yellow sponges. These little branches here are bryozoans. There's a number of different algae, and there's also a large kelp attached to it. So a single horse mussel can create a little island, a little, and they've been called oasis communities because they, they create their own little habitat in themselves. And when you get horse muscle beds, you get a whole complex structure there. And we call these structures biogenic habitat. Mm -hmm. Tube worms uh, that for, form from calcium, produce calcium tubes, or calcareous tube worms can form similar habitat. And the likes of blue cod fish like to associate with that sort of structure and also the likes of crayfish as well. This is a crayfish that's hiding under a log at a soft segment. And of course there's the crayfish that used to live on the ferry terminal. But also dredging and trawling can modify the actual structure of the sediment. And to illustrate this, I, I you probably remember this from my last talk, I put Layered shell, sand and mud in a, in a jar, and then filled it with water and shook it up and let it settle out. And what you get is the, the heavy, large material of the shell settles out first, then you get the sands, then you get all the fine material on top. And it's my hypothesis that the repeated disturbance over time has changed the structure <coughs> of the sediment. And I've published a paper looking at the sediment structure inside and outside separation point in Tasman Bay describing this effect. So has a shifting baseline occurred? And what, what if we were to remove fishing, what would happen? Well, luckily for us, we can see what happens when fishing is excluded from an area because the Long Island Kokomohu Marine Reserve 
has been given protection in 1992, and after 22 years of survey, surveys by Rob Davidson from DOP show some dramatic results. Rock lobster, 11.5 uh, times more abundant inside the marine reserve, and they're a lot larger in size. Blue cod are three times more abundant inside the reserve, and a lot larger in size as well. And blue mochi and power are 1.4 times larger inside the reserve compared with outside. But interestingly, kinna, especially the smaller ones, are less abundant inside the marine reserve. And what Rob thinks is going on here is that those, the predators, the crayfish, the blue cod and the like, are eating the little baby kinna. So they're holding back the grazing community, allowing those kelp to come away again. So you know, the, the system's getting back in balance. But what about the other species that haven't returned? And there's the pilchards, the snapper and the grofer, and the scallops and the horse mussels, for example, and some of the biogenic habitat and the little fish and things that it likes to like to hide in amongst those communities. You know, will these species ever return, or do we do they need a bit of a help? So relating to the second question asked of me, what are the risks associated with business as usual approach? Well, there's something that might come back to bite Queen Charlotte Sound. In the future, the sounds will be affected by climate change. The predictions are that there will be increased frequency of storms and that the storms that do occur will be larger and more intense. And so this is going to increase acceleration of erosion and cause greater volumes of sediment to be washed into the sounds. To protect what habitats that remain in the, and the fisheries resources that they support, resilience is need to be built back into the system. As Queen Charlotte Sound is a sink for fine sediment and it's been heavily disturbed and the fisheries depleted, what remains needs to be protected. And to build resilience, I'm going to suggest going a step further and taking steps to mitigate the sedimentation and possibly to restore missing habitats and species. Thank you.